I have to say before I share my words that a few weeks ago uh, I was mowing the lawn, I put on my headphones, and I listened to last year's Rosh Hashanah service. <laughs> it's much better than the lawnmower. We started the service by saying how proud we were to have 100 people in our sanctuary. Look where we are a year later. That is part of what today is. It is about seeing the faces we have not seen, about showing how we've grown in life, about being in awe of the beauty of where we are, even if the struggle is not over. And so I thank you, and it's wonderful to see so many faces. A sensitive human being looks out brilliantly at the world. What a beautiful piece of art this world is. I'm overwhelmed by the grandeur of a beautiful sunset, the miracle of childbirth, the sound of waves crashing on the ocean, the steady beat of a heart. The world, he says, it is nothing less than a palace. But then, the sensitive human being, so attuned to the world's natural beauty, looks again. The world he sees is in flames. It is full of bloodshed, injustice, and strife. The palace that he saw a moment ago is now being destroyed. It has become a battlefield of pain and horror. And so the sensitive human cries out, where is the owner of this palace now? Where's the master builder who made the mountains and placed a soul into the baby that was born? The Midrash tells us that the man in this story was the first Israelite, Abraham, thousands of years ago looking out at the world before him. And of course, the owner of the palace is God, to whom Abraham addresses his question. But when I came across this story a few months ago, I didn't just see Abraham, I saw myself. I saw you. I saw us today, just as he was 4,000 years ago, looking out at a beautiful world and too often finding that it's on fire. In our return to some sense of normalcy, we're seeing the world anew. Watching our kids return to some normalcy at school was like a little bit like dropping them off at kindergarten for the first time again. We saw the joy of our kids learning next to their peers. We returned to in-person learning also. Bagels are back, we've been saying. So are the beauties of a Broadway show and the sound of a full stadium. And we've started to travel again, to see the people in the places that for too long were out of reach for us. And so we see the palaces. One of my favorite palaces that always shows up in great lights this time of year happens during college football season, which I love to watch on a Shabbat afternoon. I love the game. I love the sound of a marching band. But I also take great pleasure in the two-minute promotional ad that each university places into the middle of the game. Who watches the ads? Yeah, I'm not the only one. Good. These ads are well-constructed images by the university. They show the grandeur of a college campus. And then they're usually paired with the earth-shattering innovations of what their students are doing to save the world. What they're accomplishing today, it's a little moment of awe in the middle of a football game. This year, in addition, I found myself caught up in the US Open tournament. I caught one match of the men's tournament, but my kids and I seemed to get enthralled with 21-year-old Polish woman Iga Swiatek, who ended up holding the championship trophy above her head. There I was, Abraham, looking at the palaces of this world. How could we not say in America that education has been treated like a palace when we see those buildings and what those students are doing? The palace that is the human body working at its best at the highest level to do what seems unimaginable at the age of 21 nonetheless. But returning to the world is also a return to a stark reality. Yes, classrooms are palaces, but are they not on fire today? 
Teachers are striking because we refuse to put air conditioning into their buildings while starting schools earlier and earlier in the summer while every year gets warmer. And we pay them less. In our first meeting with our middle schoolers a few weeks ago, I asked a seemingly simple question, how's the beginning of school? One student from a suburban district responded, the other day we practiced climbing out of windows for an active shooter drill, and then today there was a lockdown because someone brought a gun to school. But we're not really surprised. And our bodies, particularly women's bodies, in this year, how can we say they are treated as a palace? They may be able to win championships, but they have lost the ability to choose for themselves how to care for themselves. And so after two years of isolation, we're able to see the world again. We can be Abraham in awe, but we are also Abraham appalled at the raging fires. And I stand there like him and here like you, and too often, I just feel paralyzed. I stand on the sidelines looking at the palaces of our world, seeing them inflamed, and all I want to do is put them out, but how can I? I cannot put out the fire that burns in an educational system with millions of people by myself. I cannot change a Supreme Court decision that was decades in the making. I cannot stop global warming or political partisanship. So I stand there and I look at the palace and I, like Abraham, say, what am I supposed to do? We're told that these high holy days are a time to focus on the foundation of ourself, to look inward, to ask who we are. This year, we must also focus on the foundation of our world, the foundation of our society, and ask, who are we? For much of the Torah, the goal is to get to the promised land, as you know, to create a thriving society whose moral and spiritual center was in Jerusalem. The crown jewel of that work was the temple in Jerusalem, and so if you've been to the Western Wall, you have stood outside the building that was once the great temple, the center of our society. But that building fell, not once, but twice, to the ground. And when that most valuable building was in ruins, the rabbis, the next generation of leaders for our people, they didn't just stand there. They gave us a blueprint for the foundation of society when we need to start anew. Words you likely will recognize. The first words that a man, Simon the Righteous, the first of the rabbis were told to give instruction to the people after the temple had fallen, in the words of Perkei Avot. Al shlosha devarim ha'olam omed. The world stands on three things. Al ha-Torah, v'al ha'avodah, v'al gemilut chasadim. On Torah, it stands on our values. On avodah, on our service to something greater than ourself. And on gemilut chasadim, on random acts of kindness. When the beautiful places the palaces of our world, the institutions we have built over generations, and the civil rights we've fought wars to protect are on fire. Perhaps our job is not to fix the fire burning on the top floor. Our job is to fix the foundation that keeps causing the building to break, to go back to the basics, to rebuild from the bottom up. In the past few months, the voice I have leaned on most for this work is the voice of leading thinker and author of The Lonely Century, Narina Hertz. As her title suggests, Hertz believes that the problem underlying all problems today is not economic or political, it is tragic disconnection. If you think that I or Hertz are going to tell you that the world would be fixed if we hugged each other a little more, you're wrong although I'm not opposed to the idea. But that's not what Hertz is talking about. Here's her definition. Loneliness is about feeling unsupported and uncared for by our fellow citizens, by our employers, by our community, and by our government. 
Loneliness goes beyond our yearning for connection with those physically around us. It is also our need to be heard, to be seen, to be cared for, to have agency, to be treated fairly, kindly, and with respect. And she points out, don't try to blame this on the pandemic. In the years preceding the coronavirus pandemic, two thirds of those living in democracies did not think that their government acted in their best interest. Before the pandemic, 85% of employees globally felt disconnected from their company and their work. Only 30% of Americans believed that most other people could be trusted, which was a substantial drop from 1984. But we don't need this data. If I asked you what the commonality among all the mass shooters who've attacked schools is other than access to guns, we know they are all disconnected people. If we ask ourselves how our country can overturn Roe v. Wade when 61% of Americans say they're in favor of it, or, I know I'm asking you to put your math hats on, if you ask the question differently, when asked whether they want abortion to be illegal in all cases, only 29% of Americans said they'd be in favor. We know that our political system and our highest court are disconnected from our populace when it votes six to three, roughly 70%, to overturn a law that roughly 70% of us want to keep. Pick any major issue in society today, and I'm willing to bet at the root of the problem, someone has become disconnected from someone or something else. And so there are a lot of fires burning, too many perhaps for us to put them out ourselves. So let's focus on the foundation. Let's rebuild, not from the top down, not from the C-suite offices, from the ground up. And let's remind ourselves that we of all people have done this many, many times before. We've been told the foundation of our world stands on three things, on Torah, and so we rebuild by renewing our commitment to our most deeply held values. Maybe I cannot put new air conditioners into dilapidated school buildings or protect our kids from gun violence as much as I would like. But as a Jew, I certainly know how important education has been, and I will always know how important it is to my people and the communities where we live. I may not be able to personally raise the salaries of teachers, but I can be a strong voice for how valued they are as a cornerstone of our society. Why me? Because the word Torah, after all, means teaching. The word rabbi means teacher. This is who we are. We of all people know how to build a foundation based on education and learning. And avodah, the second cornerstone, service to something greater than ourself, Abraham Joshua Heschel wrote, our task is to act not only to enjoy, to act because we do not exist for our own sake. So I can't overturn a Supreme Court decision, but I can be a full participant in American society, and not just as an American, as a Jewish American, because my faith tells me that a society with a Jewish community should be a society where people are willing to give up some of what is theirs for the greater good. It tells me that participating in a democracy is not a privilege, it's an obligation. Because it tells me that I've been a wandering Aramean, as we say at Passover. That I've lived with no country at all. It tells me that I've been a slave under Pharaoh. I've been attacked when democracies have crumbled in the modern era, and so I don't get a vote on the highest court. But the last thing I would do is give up my voice in a democracy after centuries of fighting to be a part of one. That is part of the foundation I can fix. And the third basis that Simon the Righteous gave us. Gimilud chasadim. Random acts of love. It is said to be more valuable than tzedakah. Why? Because tzedakah, charity, requires that you only give of your resources. 
usually your money. Gimilu Chasadim requires that you give your time and that you give it personally from your heart. The pandemic is not fully over. We know we still face some level of separation. We know we are still missing people here today. Perhaps some connections will never be what they were. But this year, this year we will also celebrate the 75th year of the sovereign state of Israel. 75 years ago, a people decimated by war and genocide built a country. Yes, with money and with blood and with sweat and tears. And 75 years ago, a lot of American Jews were unsure whether a Jewish state was a good idea. But we loved her anyway. We gave to her anyway. Despite disagreement, we built a bridge from our comfortable place in suburban life to a distant land that was yet to be built. And now, just 75 years later, our children travel to Israel almost as easily as they would New York and probably for less money. Gimme Lut Hasadim, loving from afar, loving randomly, being able to disagree but still love each other. That's the cornerstone that allowed the American Jewish community and the Israeli Jewish community to be one community. That's a cornerstone that built a state in our world halfway across the globe because Israel and the diaspora were masters at being able to love each other from afar, to disagree, but to still be connected. If our people can create such a connection across oceans, can we not be a part of the process of creating that connection across the political aisle? I don't know if we can put out all the fires in Congress, but we can certainly help rebuild a foundation that does not let partisan politics into our schools, our health care, or our basic civil rights. Hertz writes in her book, society isn't only done to us, we do society too. Reconnecting society cannot be a top-down initiative driven by governments, institutions, and big business alone. The future has to be, in part, in our hands. And so I am Abraham, like you, tired of seeing our world on fire. Tired of watching institutions that were built to be palaces of excellence burn. And I call out to God, and to the superintendent, and to my local politician, and to my rabbi, and to the coach of my kid's soccer team, because even that can be politicized today. I call out to everyone who I think has some sort of power to make the changes I want made, and I say, why haven't you fixed this? And the Midrash says, no, Josh, why haven't you? We were given a blueprint for building society, all shlosha devarim, that it is built not with money, with Torah, with service, with love, with care and concern. And so that is what we will do this year in this place. This will be the blueprint for our religious school students as they already know. It's the theme for the holidays that we are beginning this evening, and it's the theme for our year together. We may not be able to be firefighters for every fire, but we have certainly been master builders for societies for over 4,000 years. Together, young and old, I pray that this year, as a year of rebuilding the foundation of our lives, the values and actions that can't be measured in bricks, but in connections, I pray that in doing so, we'll restore education to its place as a cornerstone of our society, restore freedoms of personal choice and religion fought for generations ago to be the bedrock that our courts, our employers, and our local leaders rely on. We are here today to work on ourselves, and we are here today to work on our world. I pray with our hearts that they are both prepared and that they are full, ready to remind society that love of our fellow, not of political party, is the cornerstone of our democracy. So let's get back to the basics. Let's rebuild this foundation. Let's put our most deeply held values underneath everything. 
our service to each other, and our ability to practice love randomly rather than see random acts of hate daily. Let's create this new foundation to stand upon. Shana Tovah.